Our world is lost in unnecessary fear and hurt. Our systems seem scientifically engineered to make you small, powerless, and always waiting for the next great leader who will fix the problems around us. Worse, we're witnessing neighbor versus neighbor while warfare breaks out around our family tables. But you have access to a spirit, a strength that enlarges and empowers you. Even better, you don't need to wait for the next big movement. You can heal the world. It's time for governance by Grace. Welcome to Grace Archie with Jim Babka. Well, I know one thing that we need to do is we need to make sure we give credit to the Zero Aggression Project. There uh, we go. For which we uh, release this show and they help us with various uh, you know, business coordination issues. So zeroaggressionproject.org, we want to encourage people to check that out. And uh, with that little be- piece of business out of the way, um, let me, okay, I, I am not today's expert. If there is an expert in today's conversation, it's Bill Protzman. So normally Bill is interviewing me and full disclosure, uh, Bill has to put up with a lot around here because I have an excessive need to be prepared. And it's driven by a very noble thing. I very much do not want to say something erroneous, make a claim that I haven't done my homework on that could potentially mislead or hurt someone. I am very, very careful about this. I, I, so while I don't want any censorship in the world, I censor myself against misinformation or disinformation or whatever. I try to be very on top of what we're doing. We prepare really hard. And I just episodes. want to say that's really honorable, Jim, because there's a lots of people out there who just talking head it and you never know what you're going to get. And sometimes that's entertaining, but that's not our purpose. Like Grace Archie is about coming to you with uh, prepared. Yes. You know, for what we're going to talk. Well, about. thank and you. In many ways, we are prepared for this conversation. Well, even so though, you know, well, I, I'm not a, a psychedelic expert. My job in that world is integration from the psychedelic experience. So I don't yes. serve, I don't facilitate, you know, I, I, I deal with the, <laughs> with the fallout from that. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm bringing that expertise because that's what we want to talk about right now is, is how is the world responding? Yeah. But I wanted everybody to know, like today I'm leaping without a net and to the degree that there is anybody like I'm Mr. Ignorant here. I, I, I am, I have some thoughts and opinions and questions. And so I'm not going to talk you out of it. Am I? <laughs> no, I, I, in fact, what I want to say is like, if I say something wrong, you know, I'm asking everybody for grace today. Imagine that. Oh, sure. Yeah. Because yeah, this too. is not, this is not me coming. Normally my mode is very much teacher, but today it's very much explorer. Right. So <laughs> one of the things that happens when you do a show like this is interesting conversations occur on the side. And every so often uh, we say to each other, we should have been recording that, right? Because it actually, like, the stuff that comes out is like, holy cow, that should have been in an, in an episode. But I, so I purposely did not have the conversation that we're about to have with you. I, you know some of my questions, but we have not had the conversation so that we could kind of react and respond to each other in real time. There's no outline for this show. We kind of talked about some of the things that mattered to us in this conversation, but that's it. So, I mean, it's, it's uh, a few texts a couple links that we've read from each other and and uh, three or four minutes worth of chatter before we get on here about kind of like how we were going to do today's show. That's it. That's the whole surface prep that went into this. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so I'm looking for grace. I'm, I'm in a completely viewers, unusual position. Yeah, yeah. Give us some idea how we did on this, you know, when you watch it, because yes. we'd like to know if this is effective a comment. for you, right? Yeah, 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 definitely. Get in the discussion. Can we start with uh, Matthew Perry, the recent revelations? Sure. I mean, like, here's where I jump right into the deep end of the pool because uh, my I, my instincts on this story. So Matthew Perry overdosed last year and died. The famous yeah. friend, star of the TV show Friends. He's one of the yeah. six stars of the TV show Friends. And it turns out that he had a drug addiction problem that was very well chronicled and the public was very well aware of it. It, 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 it had resulted in a coma hospital stay. It had resulted in losing part of his intestines um, and having to use a, uh, a bag uh, for digestion uh, at one point. And he had had relapses, been through rehabs. I mean, it, his, his problems with drugs and alcohol were legendary and severe. Yeah. And at the end of his life, he overdosed on ketamine, which was supplied to him by 
doctors and uh, facilitated uh, the transactions were facilitated by staff and friends and a prosecutor out in California looking to make a name for himself in my humble opinion has decided to prosecute these people for the death of Matthew Perry. So there's our background. Yeah, that's our background. Um, there have been many cases that come up in the news that are similar. It doesn't matter what the substance. It seems like uh, Oxy was a big deal for a while where people were ODing because they needed it. They had become addicted. And um, there's a question here about the addictive nature of ketamine. It seems like it was highly addictive as a substance, but it could have been that Matthew Perry was a highly addictive personality. And, you know, once he found something that made him feel better, he just needed more of it. But the underlying issue there is not feeling better, right? You know, so in these, in these celebrity cases, you get these individuals who take, and this somewhat has to do with their wealth, right? Sure. They, they end afford- up finding, right. They end up finding a doctor who will take, they'll pay extra to get someone to take a chance on them. Yeah. So, you know, Elvis Presley was loaded up with lots of normal pharmaceutical prescriptions. Like these are not drug dealers, right? Working from yeah. some street corner. Uh, these are people who have degrees and licenses to dispense these products. And so this happened with Michael Jackson and Prince. We yep. just went through the, we just passed the anniversary of Prince's death here not long ago. So, I mean, this is a, uh, Tom Petty, I believe. I mean, I, oh, yeah. I believe this is like a common, this, you know, we've seen a lot of examples of these rather famously, Pet, uh, Rush Limbaugh had a, a pain. He had an oxy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, what was different about Matthew Perry was that he chose ketamine. Like I, I there's a lot of other. um, I can't think of another celebrity case where the overdose was based on ketamine. I, this is this is brand new. Yeah, this is brand new. It's um, so ketamine. It's tragic, of course. In any case, but I think you make a, a good point that he was able to choose the substance he wanted and uh, and, and use it with a professional assistance. Yeah. So does but, that give like a patina of like? this is okay. Like I'm not a drug addict now because the doctor prescribed it to me. Yeah. And and that's really the question. It's not a legal question. It's a ethical question to me. Like were these doctors over prescribing and trusting that Matthew Perry would use responsibly, which it didn't seem like he was, he just had this craving for the substance because it was the only thing that helped him feel better. Okay, so I love that you ask that question because it's the type of question that I ask too, and I think it's the grace-based question. And I think part of being grace-based in these situations is not to make broad assumptions based on the fact that we have histories of other people having done these things, right? right. Like what happened here to this human being? And, and maybe what were the motivations and actions of the individuals involved? Because I can begin to think of justifications for everybody that was involved here, but I hesitated to come here and do a show about it because there were specifics and I didn't know what those were and the little bits that I've learned, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of bad. So, yeah. It's, it's not great news to know that a doctor is willing to give. Well, it's it's even worse than that. I mean, there's there's actually text messaging apparently in one case where they basically were fully aware that he was an idiot with too much money, right? So, like, that why sickens would you... me, you know, about the profession. Okay. Why would someone in the profession even, uh, you know, put that in put that in the public space in writing? Okay, can we put a pin in that? Because one thing yeah. I, you know, it's funny. I told two people I was going to potentially be doing this show today. And I promised them I was going to answer something specifically about like, okay, so somebody in the healthcare profession has done this. How do you regulate this if you don't have a state? I want to make sure we get to that. So don't let us forget. Yeah, that's the really important question. No, I really want to get into that. But I'm, I I could think of a scenario. So let's back up two steps. I I could think of a scenario where you're with someone who is using a product who, when they're not using the product, they're very unhappy. They're somewhat incapac or completely incapacitated. They are just not themselves in a way that's really difficult on them. And it's yep. difficult to watch and feel and experience. And it's difficult on everybody around that person for a variety of reasons. So, you know, you're working for Matthew Perry, you've got a job, right? You don't want to lose your job. And yep. then on top of that, 
work, not want to lose a job. He actually, in some perverted way, seems to be doing better when he has what he has. And and I could also go one step further because I believe this is this is how you do it. Like you have to kind of exercise the grace. Um, you know, everybody justifies themselves in their own minds, but they judge other people on their behaviors, right? And and so switch it and just for a moment pretend that like you're that person and you're in that role. You could say what you would or wouldn't do if you had that job, but you know, sooner or later he's maybe he's gonna fire you and put somebody else in the position who will do the thing. Number one. Yep. Yep. And, happens. And, but, but not just straight, this is not just straight, like I need the job. I I I I really think you could come to care about another human being and observe them in such deep and profound suffering that you say, well, you know, they're better off. Even this is not ideal, right? You kind of are aware of it, but you you maybe push those thoughts back in your mind as you try to 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 do what you can in the moment to comfort them, to make their lives better. And in the case of ketamine, the amount of dose that you're supposed to take is like a micro dose. You take a small amount. There's a couple of different ways to take it. The way that I'm familiar with or I'm aware of is that you can put some in your mouth and it kind of, they call it a trochee and, it, and you sit with it and it dissolves and you have to relax and stay comfortable during the time you're doing it. It's not something you do on the go. You don't drive a car while you're doing it. And um, it, it, it definitely has some impact, but it can be prescribed. This is something that's prescribed. So the stories, this is where things start to get weird. The stories that are coming out here suggest that at least on one occasion, he got six shots in a day where yeah. shots should have been twice a week. Yeah. Uh, so that there were as a situation where he was finding ways to get access to medical professionals and he's using different sources to do it. So this person that we're talking about might not have been his only supplier or facilitator. There might have been net, a network of people around him that are not necessarily in communication with each other. He may have even kept them separate because addicts are capable of being tremendously manipulative and, and get other people to supply so that the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing, right? Right. And I just kind of walked through all of that and I said, ouch. Like, right. Like I, I could start to understand why that would happen. But when you find out that he's getting six shots in a day, something is really askew there. And you've got texts where someone is saying, well, you know, how many more thousands of dollars are we be able to bleed this idiot for or whatever the exact text said? Well, now we got a different situation on our hands, don't we? Because that means they kind of were aware and just didn't care. Right. Or they they're in their self-interest trumped Matthew Perry's health and sanity. And, and, and that's hard for me, but it's also a theme that you're going to see in the psychedelic world right now, where the corporate interest in many ways gets out in front of what's best for the individual. And it's a difficult balance. We just don't have, we don't have any protocols there right now. Clinical protocols are being developed as we speak, <laughs> you know? Well, uh, you know, you just raised an interesting issue. So, uh, and I, I know we're going to, this is maybe the most important thing we wanted to discuss here today, and we're kind of getting into it early. You, you've got corporations exist for profit and get away with doing stuff all the time. And in fact, one of the main reasons that we have a government, people don't want to hear this. I wouldn't about to say nobody wants to hear. One of the main reasons we have a government is so that uh, very rich people can cover their crimes. They can get exemptions from their crimes. They find ways to basically, you know, liberate themselves from that. Yep. So large corporations create packages of, of in, uh, indemnity where you, you're, you're not subject to the law. You're not subject to the penalties or consequences of, of, of behaving with a profit only motive, uh, completely at the expense or safety of the people that you're allegedly serving. And, and you have these other, these escape clauses that are given to you in the event that stuff kind of rise to the surface. Right. I, there, I, I was thinking about this maybe from the opposite end in the, in Matthew Perry's case in that, People die of drug overdoses every day, and no prescriptions were written. And how hard, how hard is that same prosecutor likely to pursue those other cases? Like my first response, seeing that this prosecution, I just so I'm I'm a rotten libertarian. I'm just going to say this out loud. <laughs> my very first reaction, seeing a government official calling a press conference to announce that he was prosecuting these people screams politics to me. 
right? Yep. It's Matthew Perry in the headlines, and this politician gets himself in the news. In fact, he gets himself into the not just the local news cycle, but the national news the cycle. The national cycle, based on the death of a celebrity who needed help. Who needed help. That's just wrong for me. Yeah, I've got a problem with it, too. I'll be honest with you. And, and, I, and I don't understand what it solves. Well, let's, I, let's string that along, because okay. at the same time that this is happening, and maybe causing that district attorney to find the opportune moment, uh, we've got the Food and Drug Administration uh, turning away from an opportunity to officially bless MDMA, ecstasy, for treatment of depression. And for whatever reasons, and we can talk about all that, where the books cooked, where the tests bad, where was the research skewed, whatever, the FDA said no in the face of this. And, and I was outraged at the moment they said it. Right? At least outraged. they could have given us something. Okay. So this was this was fascinating to me. And 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 this is a large part of why we're sitting down here and talking. Like I, you know, yeah. I was thinking about the Matthew Perry thing, and then this comes along and I'd, Which, I'd by the been, way, uh, just so everybody knows, this wasn't a surprise because, like months ago, the FDA had had published paper that said we're not going to do this. We don't think it's a good idea. And then they came down and did it. So, in between those bookends, Matthew Perry case comes up again, and then we got the final FDA decision. And sorry, but now it's your floor. <laughs> just to put a chronology well, in it. No, I'm. So this, so th this is supposed to be beneficial to uh, people with post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. And the, the face or poster uh, representatives of this idea are troops returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. Yes. Post-9-11 veterans are um, all about using MDMA to interfere with post-traumatic stress. And and having an, enough success that, that it's risen up to the surface where you've got a former candidate on the Republican ticket who was running a conservative Christian campaign by the name of Rick Perry, the former governor of Texas, who is now a advocate or spokesperson for this movement on the basis that so many of the troops that he admires have told him this was life-changing and saving for me. I might be a suicide statistic had I not had access to this. Yes. And so he changes over just on that basis alone. And this is kind of the normal, this is the normal face of this idea. So... Yeah. I'm I'm sitting here. I, I just want to, you know, <laughs> I have been a professional libertarian. I've been a guy that's been getting paid as the way that I support my family to advance libertarian ideas in one way or, or another since October of 1999, full-time. I was doing some other stuff part-time before that, consultant. But since October of 1999, my full-time employment has been primarily about advancing these ideas. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've thought a lot about these ideas and I've done radio show and radio interviews and written articles. I've got nearly 3000 pieces to my to to with my byline on them uh, <laughs> and uh, blog posts, the whole thing, right? Shows, Grace Arkey. And I learned something here in this situation that maybe, maybe, and this is going to seem initially very heretical. It would be wrong to legalize to legalize psychotropic drugs. Let's say psychedelic. That's the two different things. Okay, so you're um, going to well, you got ketamine. Is the ketamine a psychedelic? You're well, the expert. So there's these there's these Is weird kind of. I'm going to sharpen your statement here in a second, but there's there are these weird kind of substances that um, have some hallucinogenic effects. And some that don't. Um, MDMA is not technically a hallucinogen, although it does create a sense of euphoria like ketamine does, and it's certainly a a, a pain uh, intervention, right? So okay. you can get some physical, you can get some psychological, but you don't have like the the LSD or the five meo, like the the toad venom or the the psilocybin effects out of an MDMA trip. Okay. Okay. See, that's good to know. Cause I, yeah. I'm sitting here uh, a complete virgin on this subject. Oh, it's totally, um, I mean, it's a great I have, question, you know? Well, no, I have, so, you know, full disclosure, I have contemplated um, using one of these products 
um, wanting, you know, like, is there a spiritual experience to be had? Is there ways to, uh, I, I, ha- I am a high stress person. I have a high, high level of stress in my life. Like this is, I'm very, I'm almost, I'm very much driven to it. Uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> the audience can probably tell I'm a bit of a type A personality. Um, I'm the guy in the room who is trying to get things done, who is trying to like get everybody to think about how to move the whole band forward. Right. Um, so most of my work, even though I'm a writer by trade and I do nonprofit work, most of my work is strategizing. I'm, I'm constantly in a problem solving mode and I'm attracted to problems. Like I'm attracted to fixing, uh, uh, relationship issues or, conf- or communication difficulties or improving efficiency in something like the, the, the I'm, I'm attracted, I'm, I'm drawn to those kinds of things. Like, and, and I'm always have this big picture in mind and I take on way more than I should. So, okay, maybe I should be doing something to, to help manage that. Maybe it would help. And then there's the spiritual aspect of doing a psychedelic. I, I mean, people are reporting it's just done incredible things. And I'm just, I'm very, I'm, I'm a person who has uh, spiritual thirst. I, 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 I hunger after insight into the universe, the world I live in, uh, the nature of the relationships I'm in. Like I, the, all this stuff really matters to me, which is why I'm driven to do a show like this. So I've thought about doing it, but Bill, I'm, I'm, my ignorance is in, in part that I have no experience to this. I'm, 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 I'm commenting today. It's like, it's like, uh, the old joke about economists. They're like, uh, virgins talking about sex, right? Right. I, I, I am that virgin in this case. I feel that too, you know, cause I, I, the, the, the people who are really on psychedelics are really into them are people who do like psychedelic journeys many times a week. Right. And that's just who they are. Imagine. I couldn't imagine. Like how do right? they have time? Where do they get the time? Well, that's their, <laughs> that's their, right. That's their thing. Right. So that's what they do. So uh, that's where I'm at. Like, holy cow. Like Wouldn't I'm busy. Be cool? It'd be where like, do I schedule you know, that <laughs> as a musician. It'd be great to be making money playing, you know, eight hours a day. So, um, <laughs> But, but 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 you know what? I, I want to say that I agree with you on this, uh, that maybe legalization of uh, psychedelics is a necessary thing. However, I'd like to make a distinction here because I feel strongly that if you can grow it, it should not be regulated or legal or, or yeah, made so illegal. This is, this is the epiphany I'm at right now. Right? I, 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 the reason I set the stage and said I've been a libertarian for all this time is to say, I'm very close to this old. It's just a couple last couple of weeks that I, you know, since this announcement was made that the FDA wasn't going to improve it, approve uh, MDMA that I went, wait a minute, wait a minute, maybe the wrong remedy for many of these things. And particularly, like you said, the stuff we grow. So uh, isn't it the case that psychedelic basically means like soul path or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So um, there's a word for this now that we've started to use called we, like I'm part of this, but that you <laughs> that anyone may use, anatheogen, which is about the soul path, right? It's the these these plants, these mushrooms, this the ayahuasca, whatever. Um, those have traditionally been a way to find God. Like okay, it's psychedelic. Then that. okay, I maybe got the two confused. Had some had something to do with uh, spirit or something. Yeah, like, yeah. So there there's this. <laughs> so the spirit molecule i mean we've we've been using words like to describe these things okay so there's this deep uh and you know that seems relevant we're sitting here talking about maybe having an experience or a trip but there's this deep deep concept and and it you could state it this way are psychedelics spiritual tools with scientific implications or are they scientific tools with spiritual implications and and what i so Colorado legalizes this this category. Yeah. And when they did it, they did it the same, they followed the same playbook that was followed on marijuana, which was to make the medical exemption first. That's yeah. the that's the foot in the door. And once people are comfortable that it doesn't, you know, uh cause you to grow hair on your palms or whatever it is, you know, or go crazy, you then are able to start to expand the number of things that it covers until eventually it covers uh recreational is the wrong word. Yeah, it is, isn't I, it? There, there are there there definitely is a thing called recreational use. 
Like yes. there are people that I think get to, to do it as a hobby or they do it as an, as a getaway. It's, it's entertainment to them, right? Yeah. I'm yeah. going to get together with my friends and play cards and we're going to get stoned while we do it, or we're going to yeah. dance and we're going to take whatever. So they're going to, so there is that, but most people are using it to deal with some kind of state or difficulty that they have or to have some kind of spiritual experience. Like that's, or they might even be, able, I'm sorry, there's a third category. They might be doing it for, for pure health reasons. Yeah, right? there may be cases where like cancer sufferers get a lot of relief if they're in pain from pot. And um, that's a, a perfectly legitimate health benefit. Or deal with nausea, right? Or to deal with nausea. Yeah, maybe appetite. their medication even causes nausea, right? Yeah. Or maybe they could use, use it to deal with pain. They use the cannabis portion to deal with pain, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because it, it helps them. It takes just enough of the edge off, but they don't really lose control of themselves. Right. And they don't have any risk yeah. of overdosing. Right. And, and by the way, for, uh, with the possible exception of ayahuasca and by the way, it's important that working with these whole sub plant substances, things you can grow that you have guidance. So I'm not recommending anybody goes out there and just grows their own mushrooms and goes tripping, but, um, the spiritual guidance that comes with these medicines and they're often referred to that way, whole plant medicines, is a component of the experience. You cannot, in, in responsible use, you cannot separate the two, you know? Like you could go to a shaman and say, hey, you know, I want to take a psychedelic trip because I'm feeling chronically depressed. They won't do it until, if they're responsible until they have discovered what your spiritual health is like and where that's going because the people who've been doing this for a long, long time, for generations, understand if you get the spiritual stuff right, the physical follows. Does that make sense? Okay, it does. But then, so, so Colorado goes on this path to legalization and politically speaking, scientific explanations or medical explanations, not, uh, you know, notwithstanding all the nonsense we just went through with a certain uh, product that was, you know, we call big shot. Yep. Um, kind of, you know, exposing the anti-scientific underbelly of most of the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, this is how they operate in normal, folks. This is their normal mode of Got operation. Um, and it's a lot worse than you can possibly imagine unless you've looked into this subject and then you know uh, how bad it is. I, I, I'm actually the epiphany for me now as a longtime libertarian. I keep hinting that I'm getting at this is that legalization means we put the product in their hands and they become the shamans. They become the controllers of it. Well, and I, I, they might be. I mean, we, we tried that in Oregon, too, with psilocybin and medical work, and uh, the clinics were charging so much money that nobody wanted to use them because you could grow your own. Okay, so there's a difference between legalization and decriminalization. Yeah. And if you were truly in a complete decriminalization regime, let me be clear about this, because there's various types of decriminalization, but a pure decriminalization regime would allow you to manufacture or grow your own product. Yes. Which, by the way, is happening with heroin, speed, streets, uh, you know, what's it called? Fentanyl. People are manufacturing these products with various levels of clarity and whatever, and we've done a whole series with Christina on that. We're going to, how, we're yeah. going to, that's coming. That's coming. We've already sat down with somebody that we're going to be sharing with you very shortly uh, on the drug legalization question. So uh, yeah, I'm not looking it, to go too deeply into that question today. That's manufacturing. Really... I, so it, Jim, to me, when you say manufacturing or growing, the manufacturing part is the part that, uh, that needs attention. And, and that may be where attention I have from to agree what or you. whom. Well, yeah, somebody needs to make sure that those products are, are manufactured responsibly so that they're pure, that they're used responsibly so that nobody dies as a result, <laughs> right? And, and that there are clinical protocols because a manufactured substance, it does not occur naturally in nature, even if it's refined from one that does. I mean, we, we're humans, right? We have a tolerance for these manufactured things, as we know from the big C. Uh, there's, that is a, fine with regulation in that area go ahead state do your thing i'm not 100 percent not and 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 it's interesting i think that one of the reasons that i ultimately wanted to have this conversation with you today is because of this th these these types of issues so there is this consistent problem where if you're a voluntarist or an yep. anarchist 
or a really hardcore libertarian, you were constantly put in the position where you were given the worst case scenario. And then you're asked to defend the principle against your scenario. Okay. Yep. Yep. And what most people do, what most libertarians do, and this is really unfortunate because they don't really know what to say next is they retreat. And I refuse. Okay, because first off, we have to acknowledge where there, utopia is never, ever one of the options. There's no place in which these products won't be used or some product as a substitute won't be chosen to achieve the end that is being sought. Okay, that is that is the constant that will be here regardless. Yeah. So there is no state in which you say, well, if we make drugs illegal, people will stop taking them. Okay. We already know comically that this is not true, ironically that this is not true, and pathetically that this is not true. Yeah. It is not true. Okay. So given that it's not true, what happens next? Now, I think there's a very, very good argument for someone to say, if it's legalized, then it'll be regulated, and there's a whole host of bad black market things that will not happen if it is legal and regulated. And I think that is an improvement over a drug war, a prohibition war yeah, targeting yeah. dealers and, and users um, because that is what drives the various criminal pathologies that are present. But markets ex also are something that exist in nature. And everyone has, has, again, we have a group of people with certain needs. And if those needs exist, there will always be suppliers for those needs. Yep. Yep. And the question is, what are they going to have to do to get to the starting line? So if what they're going to have to do to get to the starting line is capture a territory, they're going to capture a territory. If what they're going to have to do to get to the starting line is they can't get the stuff they want, and this is one of the things that the government does very, very badly, that's almost never accounted for by the people throughout these uh, extreme hypotheticals and say, what are you going to do with that, Mr. Libertarian? Um, and that is that the government often creates the problem. So there's this substitution effect where... Yep. Uh, uh, we have, um, uh, what is the drug Walter White makes in Breaking Bad? Meth, right? Meth, you have meth. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Meth is not a naturally, like people aren't waking up and going, you know what I really need is some meth. They're getting meth because other things were not made available to them. That's right. Or were, be, had become too expensive due to the prohibition. So there was yep. a substitution effect that occurred. Fentanyl is another one of these situations. People know that a fent fentanyl overdose is very easy to achieve and very deadly, both, yep. right? This includes the addicts who are taking the substance, by the way. Yep, they know this, and they do it anyway. Why? Well, they couldn't get heroin, which is not as dangerous an opioid as fentanyl is, right? So we have this regime that says we notice a heroin epidemic. Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to constrict the, the number of uh, you know, pain relievers or whatever. We're going to have a war on heroin, whatever we're going to do. And a substitution effect begins to take its place. So this is literally caused by the government. So it, let's just assume that every, there was no state for just a moment, right? They're not in the picture at all. They can't regulate or participate in this program whatsoever. All right. What would be the state of nature for people? Well, most people would go buy something that was relatively safe, right? That was going to do exactly what they wanted to do uh, for a price they could afford. And because so, there's people looking for that, because of the way competition in a marketplace works, there would be people who provide those things. When you're not seeing them, when you're not seeing them, right? it's the because of the prohibition. You get way back at the turn of the 1900s. Oh, listen, you could you know, send, Harry Brown used to make this example. You right, could right. send your 12-year-old child to the pharmacist and say, my mom wants heroin. And they would hand it to him. They'd sell it for money, and the child would walk home with it. And we didn't have a childhood drug problem at that point. The, the fact that there are uh, children drawn into the drug war has a lot to do with the business structure that is erected as a result of prohibition. And with the, the government structure, right? <laughs> the sentencing structure in particular drives a, a system where you want minors participating on the very front lines of the distribution network because they're the most likely to get arrested and they will face the least penalty for doing so. Yep. They become very yep. vulnerable. So the pretense that somehow or other, like if a market operated under normal natural circumstances, would utopia occur? No, but that's no. not the right question to ask. That's, yeah, that's it's, not it's where we're to going. Compare it to where we are now, 
with where we could be, which is where people would, the substitution effects would be gone. The iron law of prohibition. The iron law of prohibition basically says that if you have a prohibited substance, you concentrate it into a very small amount so that you can transport it uh, yeah, economically easy to transport. and avoid detection. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, th that goes away, right? Uh, if you can produce out in the open, you're more likely to, pra to practice safe manufacturing, right? It's the fact that they get pushed kind of underground that causes the, the even that risk. Yep. Um, th there's just, there's so many of these things that are just kind of like, you know, overlooked in this process. So I, I, I'm going to stand by the idea that, that manufacture is, 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 it would actually lead to a better situation than the one we have now. If people were free to do it, I don't really believe that now <laughs> would regulation occur. That's a whole nother thing. Like we could, so this is the subject I promised to get into. Let's do it now. If you don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's a perfect segue. Regulation is a, another naturally occurring thing. And one of the things that I believe even libertarians get wrong is that they suggest there are people who are in the free market uh, or capitalist, uh, have a capitalist bent, who will say that regulation is bad. Regulation drags down business, it decreases profitability, it costs jobs, it hampers uh, innovation, et cetera, et cetera. So regulation is just bad, it's evil. Well, that's not true at all, okay? Regulation is actually something that makes sure that everything is safe or makes sure everything is uh effective or, you know, et cetera, right? It does something that the consumer would should and would want under normal circumstances. It does yeah, something guidelines. that workers that should or would want under normal circumstances. It yep. does something that stockholders or owners should or would want under normal circumstances. It, reg it, it, it regularizes, it makes even or obvious or open uh, processes for all the participants playing in it. So under normal circumstances, we actually desire regulation. There's a number of different places where humans naturally desire some rule set, right? You come to the meeting and you want the meeting to run quick, right? So it's probably best that we have somebody that holds the gavel whose job it is to make sure that happens. Sure, oh, we want right. to make sure we didn't lose the money. It's it's a good idea that we have somebody who's actually counting it and then turning in a report to us so we know, we know what we have and, yep. and, and we can then make some wise decisions. But right? those sound so, like, you know, just basic best practices to me. That's all regulations are is a series of best practices. Okay. Okay. Where the problem comes in is when you have the state do it, then it be there. The two things automatically occur. One is it's going to be one size fits all. It will not no longer take individual situations into account anymore. And two, it's going to be it's going to be captured by the very entities that are looking to get special privileges against their competitors, or ways to shield themselves from from damage from from their customers that they may have injured, and so on and so forth. It's going to become corrupted by regulatory capture, where they literally place themselves on the board. And if you look around at all of these industries, pharma is the biggest example of this. They have captured the government, lock, stock, and barrel. Okay. And in fact, a lot of the stuff that we've got going on right now, the debate we've got going on about censorship and misinformation, disinformation, this is a pharma driven construct. Like literally there are pharma lobbyists that want this to be part of the discussion that we're having as, as America and how our social media platforms and platforms like the one you're listening to right now, they want to end discussions about various things because they, and they want to use the heavy hand of the state to do it so that they can continue to operate their practices in a way that is non-transparent, that is not consumer friendly, that is not even stockholder friendly in some cases. They want complete unaccountability. But when, okay, now, let's assume you're a doctor. Let's go back to Matthew Perry's story. We have the situation there where a doctor clearly acted against the interests of his patient. Okay. And do you know who actually is concerned about this? I'm going to give you two groups. I guess either one. There are two groups that are keenly concerned about the fact that a doctor would give out a prescription without regard for his patient. In fact, will wanton disregard almost loathing of his patient. Would the two uh, groups AMA come into the American Medical Association? There you go. And what is the AMA? Define the AMA for me. Let's pretend like this oh, is gosh. one of the people that actually wants to be a good guy. They're Never really even thought right? about it. But 
they're they're lobbyists. It is a, but it's, you, it's, it's a, a position you join, right? It's yeah. a professional association. It is what used to be called a guild. Yeah, a guild. A guild. A group of professionals doing a job in a similar way uh, uh, who have an interest in best practices. Okay. So there's one other group that cares about this, and I'm going to connect the two of them together. Who's the second group? I don't that have any, anybody's guess. Is it American Psychiatric it's Association? It's the, the consumers. The consumers. Okay. So okay. It's, it's the regular public that needs to go to doctors. Do, do we have advocates for this purpose, or is it just like all of us together? Well, one of the things that ends up happening because the state provides these services is that uh, the muscles that we normally use, the social muscles that we normally use, atrophy. They oh, weaken yeah. in, in, with disuse, and they go away. So, th okay, this is the world that you should live in and don't. And doctors would still be making house calls, and you, they would know you on a first-name basis, and they would give a shit about you if, if what I was describing was reality. So right. what we do right now is we put we we put these doctors through years and years of medical school and training at a huge, huge, huge expense. And then you get access to the surface at a huge, huge expense. And the doctor that's serving you is deep in debt and has to make a lot of money to pay off that debt. And while they're doing it, they've got to follow the rules. And the rules are written mostly in our country by insurance companies and pharma, not the doctors. And you mentioned the AMA. Unfortunately, that organization is a willful participant in what's going on right now as our major hospital chains. I mean, the whole system is rigged by big. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It, it's just it's just big and bloated and unaccountable and 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 doesn't really even consider you its customer. But if you had a situation where there was a guild, I'm gonna use the word guild very on purpose today, um, where there's an association of people who say, you know, we're professionals. And we care about the reputation of our occupation. So here's what we're going to do. Bill, you're a doctor. We're going to give you uh, a certification. You're going to sign on to a statement of ethics. You're going to agree to take ethics classes. Uh, you're going to participate in a way that says, I treat my patients in the following way, consistent with the principles of, uh, let's come up with a name for our little uh, guild, uh, uh, American loving doctors. Okay. The ALD, the American loving doctors, uh, just love Americans. They want to do the right thing and they want a good reputation with the, with their patients and a patient wanting to make sure that they get good medical care could say, and in fact, it would probably be, uh, behoove the, or the guild to publicize that they have a steal of approval that they, that only you are allowed to put in your door and, yeah. or allowed to put on your, your literature. I see where you're going here. And so I don't want to go to a doctor that doesn't have the ALD stamp of approval. There you go. But I don't want to stop there because I've heard libertarians get this far. I want to go one step further. And I want to suggest that this prosecutor who's attempting to grandstand in the Matthew Perry case raises, raises an important question to me. Who is Matthew Perry's keeper? Matthew Perry clearly was willing to spend a lot of money to find somebody who wasn't playing by the guild rules. Right. And he was, he was willing to risk his life on he that. He was willing to risk his life. And whose life was it to risk? It was Matthew Perry's. Matthew Perry has agency. Matthew Perry made that decision. But you know what? You could do real, professional, career-damaging, reputation-destroying damage to a human being who would behave like this doctor did. By reading him out of the guild, by saying, yep. this is not who we are. This is yep. not what we stand for. And you know what? You wouldn't go to a prosecutor to do this. You know, who you'd go to is the community of people who know his language and would be able to say, oh, wait a minute. What he's saying to us is bull, it's just flat bull. And he can't be in our guild anymore. Yeah. Because it would harm the reputation of our occupation. In fact, what we want to do is stand up and say, we've looked at his case and he's out. And that would pretty much end his practice. Now, does that mean he still couldn't find ways to go out and do bad things? No, but you know what? Utopia was never one of the options. Right. And somebody right. who is really determined to do something harmful to themselves or others can and will, particularly if they've got enough money, figure out a way to do it. Yeah. Even at the risk of their own life. But if we had, so what I'm suggesting, this is the irony of, of, pure libertarianism, of voluntarism, no state, post-statist society. 
is that we would have more governance. We would have more regulation than we presently have. Right. But this it would a- no longer be captured. And it definitely would no longer be uh, strictly about protecting some entity from from yes. from natural consequences. Right. Because yes. if the guild, the guild decides that they're going to side with this particular doctor who's clearly behaved very badly. Well, the guild goes circles down the, the bowl with, right with them. Right. Yep. And that's that's huge. It's huge. And it's also something that we are uh, in scare quotes protected from by the state. Like right. The state wants to do that job for us. And um, I agree with you w- with what you're suggesting here is that the, the state doesn't have a role in that. That that role is better played by other people. However, I'm also going to sidebar that statement by saying, while we move toward the place we want, which is the guild, we have to deal with the state and the FDA and its Mac machinery right now. And I think that the best way to do that is to do this sideline thing. And in the psychedelic world, although it's underground because it isn't legal, people know who the good guides are, right? They know. Okay. And see, but I don't want those people to be at risk. And I think there are people who are not yes. going and getting the treatment they need yes. and that they qualify for uh, because of the legal risks. I, yes. I, this is the fact that you have to wait until something has been stamped by the with approval by the state means that in the meantime, people will suffer. And here's, it's even worse, people will die. And that's and, why, um, uh, the Texas guy, that's why he's all behind MDNA, because he knows that if these veterans had not had an option, then they would have pulled the plug, you know? Well, and, and they did. I mean, we still have the situation. I don't know what the numbers are currently, but it was still true into the mid-teens. Yes, that That 21 or 22. It's higher. Per, per day, day, we're dying. Per day, veterans per day are dying. Yes, and and by their own hand, and that's tragically uh, still the case. We haven't made an, any. Okay, I wasn't aware that that was still the case. I thought I maybe the numbers progress. flowed yeah. a little bit on you know on that front. You know, I remember there was a you know, like let's say circa 2018 or something that was there was a challenge circulating. I don't remember exactly what year, right. where people were doing uh, tagging their friends and they were doing 21 uh, each day. They were doing they 21 push ups, yeah. right to try to spread awareness of this fact, but awareness is insufficient. Like, okay, now you're aware. What do you do? What do you do? Like and what you, you do is you, we should all be in a place where we practice human respect. So anytime that we use coercion against other human beings, anytime we do this, anytime we say, you know, we're going to interact, let's say a prohibition regime, we're, we're diminishing the happiness and prosperity of other people around us. It's it's just consistent. This is a principle. That's what human respect means. We have to recognize that other people have their own happiness goals. They may not match ours. In fact, they probably don't, but that's not our issue. Whether or not they're doing, we think that their, their values, let alone their tastes match the ones that we have is none of our business. And, and I'll go one step further because even doctors can be implicated in what I'm about to say. You may think that what they're doing is, is, is a freak show. That it's uh, voodoo, that it it uh, that it's fake and phony, and it doesn't work. You can think all of those things. Like I, you know, I'm aware of a situation uh, pretty close to me of someone who did something to help himself sleep at night that was so patently anti scientific and absurd that uh, actually his wife did it for him. That that to do it was uh, laughable. And when he told me that he was doing it, he said, "I'm not going to apologize for this." All I know is that the problem was there and I don't have it anymore. Now he said, it may be, it's all in my head, but I still don't care. <laughs> He's yeah, like, I, mean, I don't need released. any scientific study. The problem for me is gone. Yeah. And that's what human respect looks like is to look at that situation and say, you go brother. If that worked for you, you keep going. And let's bring zero aggression in on this too, because that coercion that prevents you from getting help you need because, you know, the, you're in the box and you can't move outside the box because it's illegal or what for whatever reason. That coercion, that's aggression. And if you need help, and I'll speak for my own self here because chronically depressed, suicidal ideated, all of that stuff, if you need help, the last thing you want is to be told what to do. Right? Okay, so you're we'll do this. You we'll had, do this. You've revealed this on the show before. This is not the first time you brought this up. So you yes. you, you had a moment in your life where you were about ready to commit suicide. You were on the edge of doing that. Yep. Yep. And 
and and if someone had told you don't you take instructions <laughs> okay so what do you need at that moment what you need at that moment is um it's the opposite of aggression it's the opposite of coercion I, I, so could could we posit that maybe that's hope like in this particular case would you want to know okay wait a minute there might be something i could do about this yeah it's you need you need a lifeline right okay and and it's got to be the right lifeline but most of us when we get to that place don't feel like we have that at all i, I haven't told you about this before for a while i ran a group for people who were feeling suicidal and um I like to say it worked so well that we had to end the group because nobody needed the help anymore. But one of the things that people who are suicidal need is someone who gets it, who understands them. They don't want to be sent to a psych ward or whatever. They want to have a conversation with a real person who doesn't have an agenda, who doesn't have a spiritual or religious agenda, who doesn't have a legal agenda, who doesn't have a medical agenda, who is just there, like in that who might, place. Who might, you're saying might be exercising grace. Yes, human respect, Jim. Because there's different ways that you could frame grace. Um, the the version I was raised with was a two word definition that said unmerited favor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 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 what that means is okay. I'm not. I didn't do anything to deserve this. In fact, I might have done something that is actually makes me more undeserving than deserving. Like literally, the situation's in reverse or, or oh yeah, well, even or upside even down. Thinking about suicide and or saying to someone that you're thinking about it can be a trigger. Okay. So, but then you give them favor anyway. You give them favor anyway, right? You so we we, we kept favor. talked repeatedly about the idea of like you've got your enemy who's marching the street in front of you, and you say, "Hey, come sit with me on my porch and let's drink some lemonade together, and let's have a conversation." Yeah. And what I want to know is what's your deal? Yeah. This, this is kind of the model. Right now, right. let's talk. Um, and that's all you need at that moment is is yeah. is. I mean, we're we're literally from from a biblical perspective, you're invited to actually sit down and have a cup with your enemy. Yes. There's literally a table that's prepared before you in the presence yes. of your enemies. Yes. You're like you're supposed to start to see them in a different way, and 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 you'll notice the exercise I walk through as we started talking about the parties that might be around Matthew Perry. Now we do know some more things about them individually. And some of this is pretty reprehensible, but, but kind of like trying to understand maybe possibly where they were coming from before right. we complete our judgment or, or maybe even instead of in lieu of our judgment, we practice this grace. Yeah. Um, because I suspect that if we made these things, and this is where I come down on this, I, I, I actually, at the end of the day, I, I couldn't help thinking that we're going to give this, this power to major drug companies who have consistently behaved badly in so many different ways. And that maybe what human beings just need is to be free. They don't need a product. Like maybe there's this problem in libertarianism where we've married consumerism. We somehow are baptized this in. And I have theories about how that happened. We're at a point where I don't want to go. That'd be a completely different rabbit trail to go down. But I'm increasingly thinking about this kind of the spiritual state of, of worship of money. Right, as being kind oh, of a determiner, yes. kind of a determiner of virtue, right? That yeah. all market stuff is good. Well, yes, but what do you mean by market stuff? If you mean manipulation of some kind, right? Was that really market stuff? I, I, I just, I hope I'm being clear here because I'm, I'm, you know, we're at the end of the show and I'm trying to, I'm trying not to uh, create another episode right here in front of everybody, but I'm, I'm thinking about just being free enough that we can make all of our own arrangements somehow. We don't have to go to some licensed thing, some big, whatever, like we would be able to do what we wanted to do. And most of us, most of the time would choose to do the right thing in the right amounts of moderation because we have lives, we have dreams, we have goals, we have people that we care about that we're responsible for that would, that regulate our behavior. And dealing in these edge cases and using those as excuses to not do the right thing for a large body of people who need help inherently feels ungraceful and wrong to me.